Hello, and welcome once again to Lato is Law. I'm Steve Lato, attorney at law in the state of Michigan. Today we're going to talk about the pitfalls of the Montana license plate scam. The Montana license plate scam. It's back in the news. David Tracy of Jalopnik, good friend of mine and fellow Jeep aficionado, wrote an article recently about how Georgia is cracking down on the Montana license plate scam there. Uh, and I wrote an article a few years ago for uh, Jalopnik that he linked to, and so I've gotten a lot of feedback on that as well. Someone asked me to do a video, so here we are. Uh, in case you don't know, the Montana license plate scam works like this. Uh, Montana has no sales or use tax and no vehicle inspections. So uh, if you were to buy a vehicle in Montana, no sales tax, uh, which seems like a pretty cool thing. Uh, but the problem is, of course, if you don't live in Montana, how do you take advantage of that? So there are websites out there run by attorneys and other people who will help you set up a limited liability corporation, an LLC. And you set that up in Montana, and this is how the thinking goes. The LLC buys that supercar or that RV that costs six figures, and they own it. And they register it or license it or whatever you want to call it in Montana. And then, of course, you as the sole owner of the LLC can then just drive it around as your company car in any state you want, including the 49 that aren't Montana. So if you ever go to a car show and you see a lot of high-end cars, don't be surprised if you see some with Montana license plates. And if you go through a uh, RV park or a state park where they have camping, you'll often see uh, RVs with Montana plates. And many of those people are not from Montana. Many of them are from other states, and they simply did this to take advantage of the favorable tax situation in Montana. So I wrote an article pointing out there are some pitfalls to this. And um, uh, almost immediately upon that going up onto the internet, I got a frantic email from an attorney in Montana who said, Steve, quick, take your article down. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you, if I took down every article and everything I did that people disagreed with on the internet, I would have no internet presence at all. So I wrote him back and said, uh, no, but why? And he said, well, I'm an attorney. This is all I do. You're going to put a dent in my business unless you take your article down. And I said, well, I got a question for you. Is there anything incorrect, false, or otherwise misleading or wrong about my article? And he said, well, yeah, the title. He goes, you call it a scam. And I said, well, you're an attorney. I'm an attorney. We both know that scam is uh, an opinion. Much the way if I said I don't like the Mona Lisa, I think it's an ugly painting. An art expert can't call me a liar because he believes it's the most beautiful painting on earth. He would just say, oh, you have a different opinion than I do, and we're going to have to agree to disagree. So I said, so you don't think it's a scam I do? What else? And he said, well, I've helped a lot of people with this. I said, okay. <laughs> Then he said, can I call you? Now, when someone asks if they can call you rather than communicate with you through writing, you realize that either they don't like to type or they don't want their words remembered. And I said, well, I prefer email because in case there's ever a discussion later about what we were actually just talking about, I don't want there to be any debate. I said, how about this? You can call me if I can record the conversation. And he wrote me back and said, why do you want to record it? I said, well, because I don't want anybody to be able to say later that you and I discussed something and we don't understand what we discussed. Some time went by and finally he said, fine, I'll call you. You can record the conversation. So he called me. Now, I'm not going to play you the recording of the conversation because it's too long and I also didn't ask for permission to broadcast it. I simply said I want to record it for posterity. But we had a discussion. And he said, Steve, what we're doing is perfectly legal. I said, yeah, probably in Montana. It, it, it might be. I don't know. Uh, I said, but I'm licensed in Michigan, you're licensed in Montana. Two different worlds. And he said, okay, well, uh, how could I convince you that this is correct? And I said, well, let's just walk through the hypothetical, okay? I'm not an attorney in Michigan here. I'm just a guy from Michigan. He goes, okay. I said, I call you and say, hey, uh, I want to buy a supercar, million-dollar supercar. Can you help me with that? And you say, yes, right? And he goes, yeah. I said, you set up an LLC in Montana for me. You're the resident agent for it. I pay you for this, and then my LLC buys the million-dollar supercar, and they own it, correct? He says, yeah. I said, but then I get to drive it because I'm the sole owner of the LLC. I can drive it as like a company car anywhere I want. He goes, yes. And I said, and that does not run afoul of the tax laws in Michigan. He goes, no, it does not. And I said, are you licensed in Michigan? He said, no. I said, so if I had just called you and asked you for some advice weren't you just dispensing legal advice in a state you're not licensed in? And he said, oh, I'm sorry, I never give legal advice outside of Montana. He goes, I only give legal advice inside Montana, and if I'm speaking to people outside of Montana, he goes, I'm speaking about Montana law. 
I said, so let me ask you the question again, exactly as I phrased it before. Does this run afoul of Michigan law? And he said, oh, you'll have to check with the local attorney in that one. And here's the thing. Buried on these websites, it'll say things like, sales tax is generally due in the state of registration. Your vehicles will be registered in Montana, which has no sales tax. You will need to understand and comply with use tax laws in the states where the vehicles are located. Okay? I said, so I noticed you have language like that on your website. And I go, and that's because you can't give advice outside of Montana, correct? He said, yeah. I said, so when you tell people that I'm going to do this for you, do you then tell them, oh, by the way, before I do this, consult with a local attorney? And he goes, yeah, sometimes I do. I said, oh, okay, sure you do. Uh, So here's the thing. He then said that he had another thing to add. He goes, by the way, he goes, I have a way to make this bulletproof. And I go, what's that? And he goes, I tell my clients that once they license the car or the RV in Montana, he goes, I tell them, keep it in Montana for a year. Store it in Montana. And at the end of the year, then you can take it out of the state, drive it anywhere, and probably even get it retitled in your state. I said, probably, or do you know? And he said, well, it depends on the state. I said, no, I'm in Michigan. He goes, well, I'm not sure you have to look that up. So now he's going to backpedal and say he does not know what happens in other states. I go, how many of your clients actually do that, where they literally buy the car, put it in Montana, and leave it there for a full year before taking it out of the state? And he goes, well, I don't know. I don't actually keep track of these things. He goes, but I I advise them that that's a good idea. And I said, okay, but you don't know how many people actually do that. He said, no. So I said, okay, so whatever. Uh, I decided not to pull down the article, nor did I make any changes to it. But the interesting thing is that with the recent thing in the news about how Georgia is now cracking down on this, if you were one of the people who bought a car through an LLC in Montana and are driving it in Georgia, there's a good chance that the people from the tax office in Georgia, I don't know what it's called, are to come knocking on your door one day and say, hey, you got that supercar in your garage with a Montana license plate on it. What's that all about? And you're going to say, oh, well, it's not owned by me. It's owned by an LLC out of Montana. And then you can make the argument with the people there in Georgia about whether or not what you're doing is legal or lawful. And I'm not going to advise you on that because I can't. I don't know what the law is in Georgia, okay? But it appears that the Georgia officials think the law is on their side and they're now chasing people down and saying, hey, you know, you owe us some taxes for this thing that you did. And one of the things that frightens me is there are states out there that actually reward people who narc out their neighbors and say, hey, by the way, my neighbor's cheating on his taxes, and I know because he's got a Montana-plated supercar in his garage. (laughs) And I don't like the idea about there being a bounty on my head, so I could never do this, but then again, I'm not going to be buying a million-dollar supercar anytime soon. But as your attorney, joking, of course, but as an attorney, my goal is to be paranoid on your behalf. In other words, You don't worry about things, I worry about things, okay? And that's what you pay me for. So when you come to me and say, Steve, I'm thinking about doing this LLC thing in Montana, and I'm wondering if it's a good idea, what kinds of problems should I be thinking about? And I'm going to tell you right now that the other problem no one ever addresses is the insurance, okay? And I mentioned this in my article, the pitfalls of the Montana license plate scam, that there's two problems. One is with your local taxing authority, if it's not Montana, and two the insurance on your supercar. So I'd mentioned that in the article, and in response to it very recently, somebody went on there and said, Steve, you're an idiot, which I hear quite often, uh, because I just call my agent and say, hey, put this car on my policy, and he just asks, what's the make, what's the model, what's the year, what's the VIN, and he types it in, he says, boom, your premium's going to go up, but car's insured. He goes, so my car is insured, no problem. What, what do you think the problem's going to be? And I said, well, you have a problem because if you look at your insurance policy, which no one ever does, the contract underlying the arrangement you have with your insurer, it'll say on it things like, oh, where do you keep your car? Where do you garage your car? Uh, and it'll say things like you need to keep your car registered properly or, you know, Uh, comply with the law, things of that nature. So when you call your agent, let's go through this hypothetical here. You call your agent and say, I want to add my supercar. I just got a supercar. I want to add it to my policy. I give him the VIN, make, model, year, blah, 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 blah. And my policy premium goes up a little bit. He said, they're happy with that. I'm happy with that. You're an idiot. 
To which I say, oh, I'm sorry, you're jumping the gun. Because you're happy at the moment they're taking your premiums, you're measuring the transaction at the wrong spot. You need to measure the transaction as to what happens when you file a claim. Because, of course, when you're paying them money, they're happy with you. They'll take your money all day long. When you file a claim, you will discover the insurance company suddenly somehow arrives at a foul mood. <laughs> Their mood changes. They're suddenly no longer your friend. They're someone that they consider to be adversarial to you because you want money from them. So when you file a claim on your supercar and you say, hey, I was just involved in a car accident. Somebody damaged my supercar. But hey, don't worry. I'm insured. I added it to my policy. They're going to go, wait a second. First of all, who owns the car? Because you are a person. The car is owned by an LLC out of Montana. Did you even have an insurable interest in this car? Question number one. Question number two, of course, is why does it have Montana plates on it? If you're driving it primarily in Georgia or Florida or California or Michigan, why doesn't it have the correct plates on it? And they might be able to dig through their policy someplace and find out that you've committed some form of fraud there because you've got the car plated wrong. But again, it's going to depend on your policy, and, and you have to check your own policy if you buy a supercar <laughs> through an LLC in Montana to see if, in fact, you might run afoul of something. But the point of the matter that I'm trying to make here is that when you file the claim with the insurance company, they don't just stamp it approved and throw money at you. In fact, most insurance companies don't have an approved stamp. They've got a denied stamp, which they wear out and replace fairly often, but their approval, and don't get me wrong, they do approve some claims, but they approve the claims they have to approve because they're so solid and there's not much way they can weasel out of it. But if they can weasel, weasel they will. And when you file the claim on your supercar and say, I was involved in a car accident, somebody damaged my supercar here in Michigan, but the car is plated out of Montana and it's owned by an LLC there, that's going to raise some eyebrows. And eyebrows being raised on the other side of the transaction, you don't want to happen. Now, the funny thing about it is I mentioned this to the commenter on Jalopnik who said, I just call my agent and add it. What's the problem? And I said, because when you file your claim, they might deny it based on what I just told you. And he says, well, I'll sue their ass. Ha ha. <laughs> I added the ha ha, but I could sense it in the way he wrote it. I'll just sue their ass. Now, you have to understand, I'm an attorney. I've sued insurance companies before. I've gone to court. I've stood in the courtroom and tried a case with an insurance company. I've done this. I can tell you what it's like. When somebody who's never sued an insurance company, who's not even an attorney, tells you, I'll just sue their ass, it reminds me of the little toy chihuahua that you see on the other side of a chain link fence as you walk by. And it starts barking at you like it's got rabies. And it's barking incessantly and insanely to the point where you're looking at it going, huh? And you realize that if you could translate what it was saying from dog into English, it's saying, I will destroy you. I will kill you all as soon as I get through this chain link fence. And you look at the chihuahua and you know that that's what it's saying and that's what it's thinking. And you laugh. Ha ha. Stupid dog. It's on the other side of the fence. And if it got out here and tried to bite me, it would injure its teeth on my shoes. It can't do anything to me. It's funny that it thinks it can, but it can't. So when the guy on Jalopnik comments and goes, I'll sue their ass. Ha <laughs> ha. I'm reminded of the toy chihuahua behind the fence. Because you threatening to sue an insurance company does zero. You actually suing the insurance company. Zero. They don't care. They get sued all the time. And as I pointed out in a previous video about how to vote for judges, in Michigan, to sue the insurance company, even if you win, you've got to pay your own attorney fees. So you've got to find an attorney who will take your case. And you may have to pay them money up front to sue their ass. And when you go to your attorney's office and go, hey, I've got this great case I want to talk to you about. And he says, sit on down, show me your case. And you go, I was in an accident in my supercar. It's got Montana plates on it. It's owned by an LLC out of Montana. And my insurance company seems to think that I committed some kind of fraud when I called them up and said, simply add this car to my policy, even though it's got Montana plates on it, and it's owned by an LLC in another state. And what's funny is I've had people say, Steve, how would the insurance company know that the car was plated out of Montana? I don't know. 
the police report. <laughs> they don't just pay money because you call them and say, hey, you owe me money. They're going to investigate the claim. They're going to say, show us the police report. We want witness statements. We want to talk to people. And one of the things they're going to say is, can you show us the registration for the car? And you're going to go, oh, yeah, the registration. It's a Montana registration. And it doesn't name me as the owner. It names an LLC. And the insurance company's going to go, wait a second. There's a disconnect between the person filing the claim and the entity that owns the car. <laughs> Gee, I wonder if they might jump on that like it's a loose ball in the end zone. So the concept that I'll just sue their ass um, doesn't actually amount to anything. Because if you could find an attorney to take the case, you'd have to pay them out of your own pocket. And there's a very good chance you'd lose. Because if you look at your insurance policy and read it again, which nobody ever does, and dig through it, you'll find language in there that actually says, if you've made any false statements on this application, or if you make any false statements to us in the future, we can deny claims you make based on your false statements to us. So when you go into court after you've sued their ass, the attorney for the insurance company is going to walk up to the judge at the bench and say, Your Honor, here's a copy of the policy. Here's a copy of the police report showing the car that was damaged. You'll notice there's a big disconnect here, like I just mentioned. Uh, we want the case thrown out on that alone. And there's a good chance the case would get thrown out. Now, is it possible you might get lucky and this might get paid? Yeah, it's possible. But a better question would be, what would happen to you if you were to actually call up your insurance company and say, hey, I've got my own car in my own garage here in Michigan, and I want to add a supercar to the policy. And they say, okay, what's the VIN? And you say, hang on a second. I just want to make sure it's clear. I don't own the car. I own the LLC that owns the car. And your insurance person's going to go, what? And you say, yeah, I bought it through an LLC in Montana because they've got favorable tax laws there, but I'm driving it in Michigan with a Montana plate. Are we cool with that? And see what happens. So I've yet to hear from somebody who actually said, I spoke to my insurance agent, I explained everything to them, and they were cool with it. They said, yeah, sure, go ahead, we'll slide this supercar onto your policy, even though it's titled to somebody else in another state. So, and, and again, like I said, the concept that you can just sue their ass <laughs> won't help you any. So that is the problem with the Montana license plate scam. I'm going to put the links to David Tracy's article and my article in the comments below. Questions or comments, as always, shoot them away. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.